So here's a fun fact for you. The United States has had more different Formula One venues than any other nation that has hosted a Grand Prix. While places like Britain, Germany, Spain, Italy have all had more you know, permanent venues, the United States Grand Prix has had lots of different venues purely because, well, they struggle to find a home in the United States, and the United States also has a very large population spread out over a very large area, as opposed to somewhere like Canada where the vast majority of the population lives between sort of Toronto and Quebec City and then thinly spread across everywhere west of that. So that means the US Grand Prix has been held in Austin, Texas, Las Vegas, Nevada at two separate venues as of next year, Miami, Florida, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Phoenix, Arizona, Long Beach, California, Detroit, Michigan, Riverside, California and Watkins Glen in upstate New York where they must have eaten a lot of steamed hams in their downtime. That's what they call hamburgers up there. It's an Albany expression. But the one that is often forgotten is Sebring, and that's where the championship finale and championship showdown was hosted in the December of 1959. Now Sebring is built in a similar vein to Silverstone. It's flat and built on an old airfield. And it's funny when people complain about Silverstone having no elevation change. You're not going to build an airfield on the side of a mountain. Well, unless it's Luckler or Courchevel or one of those kinds of airports but it's a historic track at the same time, characterised by its sheer bumpiness, especially on entry to Sunset Bend at the end of the lap. But the circuit looked a little different then to how it looks today. It had fewer corners and Sunset Bend was a U-turn called well, U-turn rather than what we know of the modern track. And the circuit itself occupies what was Hendrick's Army Airfield, which was used as a training base for B-17 pilots before they flew over to Europe. When the war ended in 1945, a Russian-born aeronautics engineer called Alec Ullman saw potential in the airfield to convert it for use as a racetrack so he could organise an American version of the 24 Hours of Le Mans, with the first race being held on New Year's Eve in 1950 and the first 12 hour being run in 1952. The circuit is still pretty much as was when built, especially since the actual airport sections are you know, as they were when they were built, concrete slabs glued together. And Mario Andretti once said the hardest part of the track was finding the track to start with. For this race in 1959, 19 drivers entered, and the grid was peppered with a few Americans given that it was the first full-on US Grand Prix as part of the World Championship that wasn't the Indy 500. It was also stacked full of names. There was Bruce McLaren, who at the time was 22 years old. There was Jack Brabham, Maurice Trintignant, Tony Brooks, Wolfgang von Trips, and also future world champion Phil Hill who was driving a full-up works Ferrari painted in blue and white, the national colours of the USNA. So you look at the entry list, and there's the top teams and drivers of the time. Moss, Brooks, McLaren, Brabham, Ferrari, Porsche, Cooper, Lotus, and uh, Offenhauser. Now this is a funny one. This Curtis Kraft Offenhauser was a midget car, similar to the one that's on screen right now. These things were mainly designed to run on things like quarter mile dirt ovals, the sort of thing that Mario Andretti and Tony Stewart cut their teeth on before making it into things like IndyCar and NASCAR. Now somehow this car got past the scrutineering checks, maybe due to the fact that its driver, Roger Ward, had won that year's Indy 500. Now Roger Ward isn't exactly some meme that turns up in videos by the race or whoever when they talk about something silly that happened once, like that German guy who tried to race at Hockenheim or wherever despite not even qualifying for the race. This guy has got some racing pedigree. As mentioned, he won the 1959 Indy 500, which at that time was part of the Formula One World Championship, making him an official Formula One race winner, having as many wins as Carlos Sainz, Olivier Panis and Robert Kubica. He was also the first driver to run nitromethane in an engine, and at Lime Rock Park he beat these expensive and exotic European racing cars at a Formula Libre race at Lime Rock in the July of 1959. Oh and he's the designer of the Pocono Raceway. So the Murican had beaten the European purpose-built sports cars in something that was supposed to be run on a quarter mile dirt oval, and he'd got quite the inflated view of himself because he'd managed to pull this thing off. And Alec Ullman actually invited him personally to take part in the US Grand Prix, and he accepted because, well, the money was good. And when he was about to put the phone down, or I think he might have done it in a letter, or even when they shook hands to seal the deal, he said, I'll bring the midget. And the night before practice, John Cooper, the owner of the Cooper team, was in a hotel in Sebring with two of his drivers, Bruce McLaren and Jack Brabham. And they found Ward somewhere in the hotel. It's not specified where. Let's assume it's the bar. And Ward told them that he'd be bringing this midget. You're going to be racing this in the Grand Prix. 
said Brabham. Sure, and have you guys got a surprise waiting for you. On every turn, I'll blow you right off the road. I know what a midget can do, and I know it can take a corner faster than any of those sports cars you have in Europe. You might be faster on the straights, but when it comes to turns, you won't have a chance. Sebring has a lot of turns, doesn't it? Now during practice, Brabham and McLaren either waited for Ward to go out and start doing some practice laps, or it was just sheer coincidence. But either way, despite leaving the pits after Ward, they had caught up to him by turn one, and then did nothing but pull away. Ward was something like... 43 seconds off the pole time with Sterling Moss setting a three minute pole time to exact three minutes. You know what I'm talking about. Qualifying ended with Moss, Brabham and Brooks taking the front row as the grids were staggered a bit differently in those days. But when they turned up to race the following day they found out that Harry Shell was to be starting in third instead, not the Ferrari of Brooks. He'd set a lap so quietly and so stealthily that Sam Fisher would have been retired on the spot. So how did it happen? Well, it didn't come to light until much later, but the TLDR of it all is, Shell cheated. There was a portion of the track just after the MG Bridge that to most people just looked like an access road. But Shell had worked out that this access road actually came out onto the warehouse straight and cut out a decent chunk of the track. He'd managed to go off track, cut the course, shave six seconds off his lap, and do all of that without anyone noticing. They say you cut the course, you'll have to slow down and give up the time gained. Needless to say, several other drivers, including Tony Brooks, were quite cross about this. And while the national anthem was being sung, Brooks and several other drivers were involved in a shouting match with the organisers of the Grand Prix, wondering how the hell this cheater was allowed to start third when his best qualifying lap until that point was only good enough for 11th. Brooks was also on for the championship, so he had a vested interest in all of this anyway. I mean, can you imagine all of that going on? You've taken your hat off, you're facing the flag, you cover your heart, you know, the traditional stuff that happens with the US national anthem, and all you can hear is, Oh, see, can you see? You fucking what, mate? Or words to that effect. But all the shouting didn't help anybody in the end. Shell was eighth by the end of the first lap and then retired with gearbox trouble. Brooks, meanwhile, was punted off the track by Wolfgang von Trips and spent two minutes in the pit lane analysing the damage and then trying to get it fixed and get back out. He recovered to third, but to win the championship, he needed to win the race with Brabham scoring third or lower. The race ended with Bruce McLaren taking the victory and in the process became Formula One's youngest race winner until Fernando Alonso at the 2003 Hungarian Grand Prix. Brabham had underfueled his car and ran out of fuel with just 400 yards or so of the race remaining and had to push his car over the line, by which time he had dropped to fourth. But because Brooks had been involved in the trouble he'd been in, Brabham took the first of his three world titles. Sebring and Riverside for that matter are the two forgotten US Grand Prix venues. Watkins Glen was the home of the US Grand Prix for a very long time. Phoenix and Cota are a bit more recent. Indy is Indy and Caesars Palace is a meme. And it would be cool to see Formula 1 cars going around Sebring once again, but they would have to just sterilise the entire track and make it smoother than a snooker table, and it would kill the character of the track completely. But the only US Grand Prix to be held at Sebring in 1959, it crowned a world champion and had two extra funny stories attached to it as well. So then, a look at the 1959 United States Grand Prix at Sebring. If this has been something new for you, then do give the video a like. And if you want more stuff like this, then get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on anything I do here. Massive thanks to the folk over at Patreon for the continued support and if you want to help support me at a more personal level so I can track down some images for these videos, you can help out by following the link in the description or by way of super thanks. And in the description as well, there is links to Discord and also to my socials. So until next time, I've been Ada Millward, have a cracking day wherever you live in the world and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.